most appropriate for this time of day. It's uh, 12 and a half minutes past five o'clock. This is Maxwell Confet, and he likes sucking cock. I don't mean any disrespect by that, he just likes the cock. Like some people like a cold beer? Well, you get the idea. And this is his amigo, Winston Good. I assume he's into the same thing. And as you can see, they both like dressing up as girls. <laughs> Cute. Which is popular now, but wasn't so popular back then. Now 26 year old Maxwell likes to call himself Michelle. And he, or she, lives at this address with Good, who's a landlord. And whether they mixed business with pleasure, that is unclear. But what is clear is that this here was their playground. A syphilitic paradise for that sort of goings on. So if you're into that sort of thing, this is where you'll find it. In all its stinky glory. Book your tickets now, buttercup. And this is where Maxwell, or Michelle, likes to ply her trade, peddling her ass pussy. Most people do not adopt a Victorian moral attitude and even express a kind of tolerance. It is still difficult for a homosexual to fit into the tougher and less permissive environment that he finds there. Some homosexuals have their own places, which they must stick to. Others have nowhere. You're a real barrel of laughs. Homosexuality was made legal in England in 1967, between two consenting adults at the ages of 21. Although now five years on, many still consider it only partly decriminalized, with the legal age for consensual sex between straight adults being 16, and the legal age between two homosexual males being 21. Sorry guys, if you wanna blow your load in another dude, they gotta at least be 21. Ah, dems the brakes. But I figure they'd come a long way, considering in the 1500s, sex between two men was considered punishable by death. It was in 1971 in London that the Gay Liberation Front was formed, a movement influenced by radical black groups like the Black Panthers in the States, who had taken up arms to force change. Although I'm not sure why, but uh, this just doesn't seem as threatening to me. It was at the start of 1972, and there'd been a rash of arson attacks in the city of London. And they all seemed like they had the same MO and were set by the same person. But fish and chip eating cops didn't have a goddamn clue who. But there's one thing for sure, whoever was doing it was one step ahead. And although cops checked out all the regular pyromaniacs, they were as clean as a soul on a cripple's boot. Maxwell Garnfit and his landlord Goo's relationship was complicated and unclear. They'd met in a pub two years earlier and discovered they both had a fondness for dressing up as women. Married with five children, Goo's relationship disintegrated shortly after meeting Garnfit. Huh, go figure and Confit and moved into his house and started renting the room upstairs. There were rumors that Confit liked the rough stuff. And although Good denied that they were lovers, Confit had recently met a man and said he was moving out. This caused friction between the two men and Good said he was extremely jealous. Not a lot is known about Maxwell Confit, born in South Africa to a black father, white mother. You know the score. Maybe some are used more than others. Raised in Kenya without a father. But I guess being a single mother 
and a foreign land was too much. Max and his mother returned to England in the mid-50s. And although, again, not much is documented, it's safe to say it wouldn't have been an easy ride for a kid of mixed race in 1960s Great Britain. And by all accounts, Maxwell Confit had it pretty rough early on. And I guess it's pretty safe to assume that early on, Maxwell knew he was different. Known exclusively to friends as Michelle. And that's also in the guise how she chose to ply her trade. A dangerous trade. It was in the early hours of Saturday that the fire brigade were called out to a house fire. At 27 Doggett Road, with an arsonist loose in the area, the brigade had been busy recently attending fires almost every night. Catching the fire early, it didn't take long for them to put it out. And as they were clearing debris in the house, one of the back rooms had been left untouched by the fire when they opened up one of the wardrobes. Inside, while well, one Michelle used to be Max Confit. And she won't look in her best. As per standard procedure, the investigating officer who was first to arrive on the scene was to take a rectal temperature of the victim to establish the time of death. But as the victim appeared to be homosexual and had engaged in sexual activity, well, because they were naked, he did not want to tamper with the crime scene. My guess is, is the cop didn't want to get jizz on his thermometer in case he needed to take his own temperature later. When they got Max on the slab, the first thing they were able to establish that he'd only been recently deceased and that it had nothing to do with any fire. In fact, it was strangulation that took him to the here and the ever after, being a rope or a cord of some sort. And it seemed to be prolonged like they were letting him die and then bringing him back. Like perhaps someone were getting their rocks off. And with rigor mortis only starting to set in, they figured it were quite recent. And they were also able to establish that there was sexual intercourse with multiple fuck buddies. Which was so unusual when you take into account Max's occupation. But there's one thing for sure. Max or Michelle were no more. Before the embers had cooled off, cops were able to establish that Winston Goode was the number one suspect, even though he'd been the one to call a fire brigade and he was clearly distraught. And they found the cord that had killed his lodger in a crawl space outside of his apartment. And when they spoke to his estranged wife, she said that he was obsessed with the cross-dressing cocksucker. But enough to become a homicidal maniac? Cops were unsure. Because they knew with Michelle's occupation, it was hardly a monogamous relationship. But things were all about to change later that night when the fire brigade were called out again to the next street. And it was there cops arrested an 18-year-old youth running from the scene of the crime. Carl and Lattimore were a real simple Simon, semi-retard. Probably couldn't tell you his age without taking off his shoes and counting his toes. With an IQ 85, he fessed up to the fires and much more. They told the cops that they'd seen Michelle, liked what they saw, and they followed her home. Entered through the side door of the house, and then came into her back door. When they finished, they killed her, and they set the place ablaze to cover up the crime. A real Sodom and Gomorrah, the fish and chip eating variety. When cops brought in the other two friends, at first they seemed unsure of the details, but they came around and all concurred on the story. Young, dumb, and full of cum, they just couldn't control themselves. Although all three boys had alibis and had been interviewed without a lawyer or an adult present and claimed that they had been beaten by the police, they went to trial and they were all found guilty. And the cops, two days after the murders, had considered it solved. And although all three youths had admitted starting the fires, the rest seemed unclear. But I guess it didn't matter, because the case was solved. But Colin Lattimore's parents weren't going to let her rest, and they started writing the government, even wrote the Queen, telling them that their son had an alibi tighter than the Velcro strap on a cripple's boot. And he were a retard, he didn't get with no he, she hooker. And they had his IQ test to prove it. 
and once they started poking further into the case, it was gold, Pony Boy. It turned out that rigor mortis had been and gone, and although the teens had set the fire, they weren't to cover up any murder, and that Max and Michelle had already been in that closet dead for at least 48 hours. And the fact that the cops had arrested and questioned the two youths and a retard without a lawyer present or even adults, well, they'd already breached their rights and they were free to go. And it was a perfect example of all that were wrong with the police and abuse of power. And if police had done a little more poking around, they would have discovered that good had had a nervous breakdown two days after the crime and checked himself into a mental institution. And then he'd committed suicide almost two years after the day that his lover was murdered. And as if to muddy the waters even more, in 1981, a jailhouse confession had two men implicated in the murders with a sex game gone wrong. But prosecution couldn't use the testimony because the inmates had been accusing each other. Although now it's generally believed that Winston Goode was the killer. Gay on gay crime? That breaks the LGBTQ's heart so bad, cause they needed it to be a hate crime.